Good morning, everybody. Well, this is a very exciting panel. Uh, every year, CUGH holds a panel with leaders in various aspects of academia to really have a discussion amongst ourselves about big issues in global health and to tap into their expertise in what we can actually take back to our institutions and work on about the challenges that we face. So I'm going to be very brief in the introductions for their bios because their bios are actually all in the, um, in the, uh, on, the, on the app. So please download the app if you haven't done it already. Um, so we'll have a discussion for about 50, 55 minutes, 30 minutes or so of Q&A, and then there'll be a final wrap up from the panelists in terms of other thoughts that they may have at the close based on your questions and the presentations. So firstly, I'd be, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Patricia Garcia. Um, Patty Garcia is the former Dean of Public Health at Cayetana Herrera uh, University in Peru. Very importantly, she's a former board member of CUGH, but she had to leave because she was appointed by the President of Peru to be the Minister of Health in Peru. So she occupies a pretty rare place by having both senior academic credentials and senior political credentials. Next, of course, is Dr. Vim de Villiers. Dr. de Villiers, as you know from the last session, uh, is the Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University from Cape Town, truly one of the most beautiful places in the entire planet. Um, and of course, they are celebrating their centenary, as he mentioned earlier, this year. So we're honored, uh, Vim, that you came so far. To, uh, to Vim's left is Dr. Ann Kurth. Dean Kurth is the Dean of Nursing at Yale University. She's also the incoming chair of CUGH's board of directors and the first nurse to hold that position. So Anne, thank you for being here. And Professor Nicholas Lehman is Dean Emeritus at Journalism at Columbia University. Uh, uh, Professor Lehman is one of the most extraordinary writers in the United States. He's been a staff writer for The New Yorker. For those of you who don't know, it's one of the most esteemed magazines uh, in the United States. And we're honored, Professor Lehman, for you being here today. Thank you very much. So, I'll, absolutely. And that's our esteemed panel. Uh, so, Patty, as I mentioned before, you hold an extraordinary position for having both political as well as academic credentials and you survived a lot longer than most ministers of health in Peru. That's a huge kudo, believe me. So, and you did a lot. Can you tell us uh, what, some, give advice in terms of the folks who are here, how can academia engage more effectively with government? Yes, I think this one is on your side. Do you know that? Thank you. Okay, so, First of all, we cannot ignore the fact that we are facing really terrible and big challenges in global health. And this is what we have been talking about all these days. Um, the epidemiological transition, mental problems, the health systems are not adapted, there is social pressure, social crisis, technological crisis, I'm sorry, technological pressures bringing us new products and new drugs that not necessarily are giving us the value and the benefits that we need for the price that they cost. And so we need to improve access. We have problems with human resources. We don't have them well trained. We don't have them well distributed. They are not in the right numbers. And finally, we have this whole health system that has problems with finance. But you know what? The problem, I think, in academia is that we kind of like see all those things from the distance, but we live in a bubble. And once in a while, we kind of like bounce, right? Try to push a little bit in our bubble, and then we complain that things don't change. We get one paper or another paper. I think we have to become more brave and go really for actions. And that's what I like the title, at least, that we have for this conference. And I have five points that I want to make, my five top recommendations from the experience that I have had in, 
in being a minister, and also being in academia, and I think that helps. So the first one, I think we have to do a better job of training the next generation of people that are going to be there. And we have to train them not only to be researchers, but also to end up there, to take the challenge of taking political positions, okay? I think we're, very, we're doing very poorly in several things. We talk about climate change. We heard, for example, that Colombia is trying to engage to see what are we teaching. And actually, I was really, I was really shocked in my own university, which I think that is very progressive. I mean, we're doing very poorly teaching about the real things that we need to, do, to know about climate change. Not the bad things, but what can we do to make a difference? I, I think your university with those examples were, it's, it's incredible. So we have to train them better. We have to talk about multi, intra, interdisciplinary training. We have to enter with the concepts of task shifting, task sharing. How do we make professionals less jealous and more working as teams? And things that I mentioned, how do they start thinking that there should be these user-initiated interventions so we can empower people to do their things? That's my first one. My second, I think we, we need to keep working, proposing and working on innovative solutions, but we have to go beyond just papers. And we have to push for these evidence-based solutions to go into action and policy. That goes my third one. We have to create really enabling environments for collaboration. North to south, south to south, north to north, south to north. I think we can all, as a network, work together. And those collaborations should not be parachuting, because we see a lot of parachuting. I, I send the student, the student camps. I mean, that doesn't work. It needs to be a really good thing. My fourth. We need to develop a more active role. We, we need to promote a more active role in the development of policies and the participation, as I said, on governmental positions. It's not easy. I mean, I have lots of bruises still, okay, and scars, because it's hard to be in those positions. I mean, you saw the first day, a person that comes here. I mean, you're gonna be exposed to all kinds of things when you are in the government, but if you, if you really want to make a change, you have to go there. And maybe we could start thinking about how can we adopt, adopt a congressman or how can we adopt a politician. And so we can start teaching them and bringing them also in the kind of things that we do in academia. And my fifth point, and, and this is something that I don't know how to do yet, but we have to think about. We cannot ignore that in the world, and in the world of global health, and in health in general, we're having a lot of corruption. How can we, as academics, start fighting the corruption that is one of the things that really are not allowing us to make things better in health? Those are my five. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Thanks for bringing up the issue of corruption. It's interesting, isn't it, that the amount of money lost every year to corruption, according to Transparency International, is about $1.5 trillion a year. Ironically, that's exactly the amount needed to be able to achieve the sustainable development goals. It's true. But the interesting thing is, well, we can get into that maybe a little bit later on, which we'd love to, is, but more than half of that responsibility points to us because we're responsible in part for allowing the massive theft of resources from low-income countries. Vim, you're a vice chancellor. By the very nature of your position, you have to work at the interface between academia and politics. What would, you be, what's your, what would be your response be as to how academia could be more effective at engaging the political class given this tragic gap that we're seeing between knowledge produced and its lack of impact upon policies in, uh, uh, produced by, by politicians? Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe just before I start, I want to, from my previous talk, I, want, I, I talked about the water crisis in the Western Cape. It doesn't mean that I don't want you to visit the Western Cape. Please, you, we need you to come and visit. Uh, when you're there, also, you, you don't necessarily have to drink water. You can drink wine. There's very good wine <laughs> as well. And then secondly, please have a look at my socks. They're cool socks. They're South African flag socks.
So, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I, w w as, as an administrator now, as a vice chancellor, putting on a different hat um, and, and how we address some of these, these really pressing challenges. Uh, and it's, universities are really wonderful places of, of learning and teaching and, and research and uh, where transformative uh, activities take place. Um, and, it, and they're really uniquely placed um, institutions because they can look uh, really pressingly and, and uh, in a focused way at solutions to both uh, local and, and global crises. I, I always say with the research that we do at the university in Stellenbosch in South Africa should be locally relevant, it should be regionally impactful, but it needs to be globally competitive. Um, and we're a, a, a research intensive university that does work that's in and for Africa, and we've got a significant African link. Now, these are very complex issues that we face, and how do we address them also as a university? I think there's a lovely quote by the American journalist and, and cultural critic H.L. Mencken, who said, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is easy, clear, and simple and wrong. Um, and that is because these problems are difficult. That's what, what John Cow uh, depicts, as he calls them, the wicked problems. Well, what are the wicked problems? The wicked problems, they're highly complex challenges. They're comprised of interwoven issues whose potential solutions really require creative interdisciplinary thinking. And that's what universities, I believe, are, are uniquely uh, capable of doing. Uh, and that we, we've developed expertise over time, we build collaborative networks globally, and we can do this sort of uh, interdisciplinary thinking. But I think sometimes we're, we're too, we're not bold enough. We're, uh, there was a mention made of, of, of a bubble. We have to be careful of that. We're not bold enough to, Jim Collins in his book, uh, Good to Great, he coined the phrase, the big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, and we've got to be bold, and, and really tackle, tackle those issues. Um, and, and because then, in that interdisciplinary fashion, we can really uh, also address these wicked problems and what I also call the, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, which would be poverty, inequality, unemployment, and, and corruption. Um, and I think with, we, we have so many opportunities to do that through social impact, through interaction with government policy, in South Africa's case, the interac interaction with, um, with a national development plan to make sure we're aligned with, a, with the SDGs. I talked about internationalization through Africa. And then through these many different areas that we have available, health, agricultural, science, and, I'll gladly, uh, and, and law, governance issues, social justice issues that I can espouse on, uh, further on that we can, in the end, it has to come to sustainability in its, in its full extent, sustainability issues. Our flagship project actually at the university is, is, is not a sexy name, I'm getting, trying to get them to change the name. It's called Complex Systems in Transition. But what it really deals with is sustainability and resilience uh, issues. And that is, for example, uh, the pressing issue we have in, in, in Africa over the next 15, 20 years, which would be urban slums, the emergence of urban slums and the interdisciplinary thinking that's going to be required, how to deal with the many problems that, that that's going to face us with. So how, how could academics and universities also um, uh, shape conversations? It is by actually being opinion leaders, getting out there, getting it out in the media, and being public intellectuals, because that's what we do the best and what we will, will help us to get out of this bubble. Thank you. Well. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Ben. And um, I think you've set a new bar for national promotion, sock diplomacy. So we're going to learn about this. And next time you watch us at the next conference, I'll have maple leaves on mine. Uh, and as a dean of uh, nursing at Yale University, I think all of us lament and, the, and are really quite dispirited by the war on science in this country, um, the lack of faith that the general public has for science and evidence, and how that's translating 
to political statements and decisions that are made at the highest level here in the United States and in other parts of the world. So how do you think in your position, how can academia do a better job of actually changing that? How can we do a better job of engaging the public, informing the public, informing policymakers? Yes, I mean, we're all here because we believe fervently, I think, or uh, to some degree, in the power of academia, as well as the importance of, of health uh, and focusing on vulnerable populations. And I always think about universities as a construct. There's a reason they've lasted for a millennia. There's a continuity in the community of scholarship that we produce that, that has power. Um, we, uh, at least ostensibly, welcome diversity of thought, and we're, we're, we're skeptimistic about, about uh, the big ideas of the day. We, we probe and we add to new knowledge. Uh, but, but I do think we are in an era where we have to demonstrate our value. Um, and, and in part, what we produce as universities has to be uh, understood and felt a, a, as valuable um, to the general public as well as, as politicians. And I think we have some good examples of this uh, in many places, certainly in the United States, but I think around the world as we think about the trends of urbanization, um, some of the uh, uh, civic and, 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 and uh, uh, local um, revitalization, economic revitalization, has really been driven in, in some set part by the sector of academia. So we call this meds and eds. Uh, in many places, the, the health sector um, supported by and, and, and engaged with uh, the academic sector. I do think, though, that if we don't only uh, not only demonstrate the value of, of, of higher education, but also ensure that it is in fact accessible by a broader way of, array of the population, then we're going to be undermining our own credibility. And so I, I do think that we have to think about access to the products that we, the, the, the tools and the gifts that we uh, can give to the world. I think in, in part this has to be about our pedagogy. Um, Coursera, for example, has a, almost 700 free classes on global health. Um, our own website at CGH has, has really uh, been able to catalog over 160 different courses on global health that are offered by universities around the world. Um, and that's the kind of access that I think we are going to need to um, continue to, to do. Uh, we also, uh, of course, ultimately are the producers of the health workforce, uh, not just health professionals and, and public health, but health managers, uh, pharmacists, scientists. Uh, and, and I think that, that is a, a, an important uh, a strength but we're gonna to have to learn to do it better. So the Educating the Health Workforce for the 21st Century, the commission put together by Julio Frank a few years ago, how are we enacting those recommendations? Are we being nimble enough? We know the millions uh, that, are, uh, th that we're facing in terms of the health workforce shortages, and are we able to be um, uh, innovative enough in our delivery and our pricing uh, to produce the next generation of, of health workforce? Um, I'll, I'll just mention, for example, mid midwives, which is uh, an important sector. Lancet Commission has shown that uh, educating and deploying midwives can reduce 54 different adverse mother and fetal outcomes, uh, newborn outcomes, um, and yet um, y there, there's variability around the world, and we, we're not educating enough uh, midwives. So where, where is academia in, in really addressing some of those key uh, uh, elements that we need to have the impact on uh, human health? Thank you, Anne. Before we go, if somebody from uh, PSAV is here, one of my staff, if they could bring up uh, uh, four, three more mics, please, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Nick, as, a, as, the, as the Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Journalism at the Columbia School, uh, you, and as your position at the New Yorker, you have been using the power of the pen to be able to speak truth to power. And of course, in your profession, you do that infinitely better than the rest of us who might are not as obviously as good uh, communicators. What advice can you give the folks here, the attendees here? How can we be better communicators in being able to translate the complex work that people produce that are published in journals? How can we breathe life into them so that they're comprehensible to policymakers and the public? I want to give a somewhat indirect answer that, that I think is important context to understanding this issue from the point of view of people who aren't journalists, okay? So first of all, what journalists and scientists have in common is a kind of model of how society should work, and that is we would have democratic societies where um, people in the academy and elsewhere produce uh, you know, epistemologically verified information, then largely through the press that would be communicated to the public and policymakers, 
and, and uh, the, the way elections turned out and the way policy was made would be the result of that, okay? That's the dream. That's never gonna happen. And it's one of the oldest problems in political theory, if anybody remembers from your school days, the parable of the cave in the Republic, you know, and it goes back even before then. So for thousands of years, people have been wrestling with the fundamental difficulty of, of a democratic system uh, and an epistemologically based polis. Uh, so the first thing is to be realistic here. Um, and not assume that the dream that I described as sharing will ever be perfectly achieved. It's like saying, I'm gonna tell you something today, and after that, you're never gonna have an argument with your spouse or partner again for the rest of your life. So um, it's useful to think about this as a natural tension in democracies. Remember that Plato's solution was not to have democracy. Um, and, and, and that you can make progress on, you can make the best of, but you cannot solve perfectly. So I, I wanna set that as context. Second piece of context is just to tell you some things about what's going on in journalism. First, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, the movie The Post that's still sort of out in theaters. That takes you to our mindset. So, so one barrier to the world that's implied in your question is that's how we like to think of ourselves. There are, uh, we are like scientists, not in the sense of being scientifically literate, but in the sense of being sort of independent, courageous truth seekers who uh, expose things that powerful people don't want exposed. That's not a perfect fit with the idea that we exist to communicate the discoveries of scientists, because that's a sort of more passive role than many journalists like to imagine for ourselves. So if you remember from years and years ago, the David Baltimore affair, that kind of thing is, touches a very deep adrenal gland in journalists, and, and, and so that, that's a kind of tension embedded in the relationship. The really big thing going on in journalism, which for some reason non-journalists haven't fully assimilated because they feel like I'm living a life where I'm awash in news, we have 24-hour cable, we have the internet. I bet most people here don't know that about half of the journalists in the United States working in newsrooms have lost their jobs in the last 15 years. Uh, we're doing worse than coal mining in employment, um, in the US at least. The, the primary sort of repertorial engine of journalism is the newspaper business, and the newspaper business is, is, has lost its economic basis. I can explain later why if you want. Um, so you have to understand that, that we're trying to achieve something against a, a, a really catastrophic decline in the market structure that supports scientific journalism. Um, and, and, and we need to contextualize uh, how we think about this that way. Um, the good news is um, it's from, from experience at Columbia Journalism School, it's, it's really easy to build an academic program that teaches journalists to be much more scientifically literate. And maybe some of you in the room have experienced this, that the level of basic scientific literacy among journalists is a little under 100%. And, and you know, just teaching people how to read, not produce, but read uh, intelligently, publish scientific research, how to talk to scientists, how to locate real experts as opposed to fake experts, that's very teachable. Um, so what I think, in, we, we can talk later about the, the larger problem I started with, but in terms of journalism narrowly, you have this huge systemic decline. On the other hand, you have uh, nonprofits that can teach journalists to do better scientific journalism and uh, other nonprofits that have come up in the last few years, an example in science is Inside Climate News here in New York, um, and, and there's you know Yale 360 is another one, um, that is a new growing from a small baseline, somewhat fragile uh, ecosystem that 
is really committed to first-rate scientific journalism. So, so what I think could be most helpful is to build up that little sector. Um, I haven't answered your question about how scientists can communicate to journalists better, so I, I'll do that later if you want. But that's just a sort of scene setter for how to think about the problem as opposed to thinking about it as you have this giant, robust journalism sector filled with people who are eager to do science journalism and somehow it's the scientists who are screwing it up. Um, that's, that's not the way to begin thinking about this usefully. Thanks, Nick. As we go sorry, through sorry the, if that's no, depressing. No, but. no, 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 this is, this is what we want to hear. So th that's great because I'm really glad you brought up the assault on the media because the undermining of the media and public institutions really allows autocracies to thrive. And the work that everybody here engages in is dramatically undermined by the undermining of the media. And I want to connect that to... Okay, just one please, comment yeah. on that is in, in Turkey, that's a huge, huge problem in much of the rest of the world, in Russia, et cetera. I, I think in the United States, to frame it that way is a bit of a distraction. That is, we have an extraordinary circumstance of a president of the United States who directly attacks the press in general and attacks specific reporters and news executives by name. That gets your attention. What is also going on is this tremendous depopulation of journalism, and that's the most more important and alarming development in the U.S. for the kind of journalism we want. Thanks, Nick. And I wanted to, I mean, P Patty mentioned what I, I think is probably, in my personal view, the most neglected area in global health, which is the rise of corruption and the impact corruption has. Um, official development assistance is an order of magnitude less than money is lost to corruption. And Patty, you have personal, visceral experience and seeing this as a former Minister of Health in Peru. What advice can you give academics in those environments where corruption may be a really serious challenge to the health and welfare of the people in the country? What, what can academia do to work with the public, with civil society, to be able to address this issue? And other, the other side, what can the West do and should be doing to address this? Because we're half the problem. Well, I, can, I keep asking myself what we can do as academia. I think that, in general, I was really surprised. I was trying to find in Peru if any of the other schools, because my school, well, my university is a university very health-oriented. And so we don't have economics, we don't have politics, but we have other universities in Lima that are very good at that. So I was asking if there were groups of people that were really doing research on corruption, okay? And so I end up finding that there was a Peruvian who was trying to analyze what was going on with corruption in Latin America and in Peru, and he ended up coming to the U.S. and um, work in different institutions, got different fellowships, and he wrote a book that I have, which is quite interesting, that is The History of Corruption in Peru. Okay, and it comes from the time of the time that we were a colony of Spain, and it was, I mean, it changes around the time. And then he, I mean, he passed, I mean, he died, this, this historian. It's quite interesting because he's historian and he's an economical historian. So it's, it's quite interesting, it's in English and in Spanish. You can find it at Amazon if you wanna read about it. And he did something in other Latin American countries. So, um, I mean, I, I don't think we have a clear solution for corruption. I mentioned when I was doing my, my first talk and I told you that Latin America, although most of the people don't think about Latin America, and unfortunately, it's, is one of, is the region less represented, for example, here in this meeting. It's, it's their region that has the most disparities. And those disparities end up causing, between other things, the decrease of opportunities, social, economic opportunities, weakness of institutions, and eventually corruption, right? So I think as, as university institutions, I think the hope is to start addressing, discussing, and see how can we 
form new professionals with ethics and then confronting these type of issues and not ignoring it. I was very moved and, I mean, angry, I would say, when for some reason, and this is something that we have to talk also with our funding agencies and with researchers, and I, I wanted to tell it, this to you. I mean, I know that sometimes we have pressures, for example, to do a project, okay? And so there are two ways to do it in a country that is not ours, right? So one is to create a parallel system, okay, that will do things much efficiently than the government or than the local institutions. And the second way is to try to bribe, bribe, that's the way it's called, right? When you give the money, bribe. And I mean, bribing in a country is just making the situation worse. So I think we have to approach and we have to discuss these issues of corruption and I think we have to train new citizens and we have to start from there. It will be interesting also to have more research regarding how to measure levels of corruption, how corruption is really affecting. You were t talking about some numbers. I can tell you that I had a, a crude experience because I was, I was not able to collect that much information, but we were having, um, we had to buy medications in Peru for 2017. And so the budget was 800 million soles, three, dollar, three soles is a dollar, so one third of that in dollars. And actually, I made this whole process as open as I could. I came into the TV, the radio. Um, I was able to have a law that allowed us to buy medications outside the country through the revolving fund of PAJO. And I was able, with just that, to save about 10% of that budget. 10% of that budget. And that, for me, when I was asking the companies why they thought that I was getting 10% cheaper. I mean, everything was 10% cheaper with medications that were high quality. The answer was, it's because we don't, we have, making it so open, we don't need to pay in the structure to be part of the process. So I think identifying and start talking in these forums about corruption because it exists, not going together with the system, but Making, making it clear that it exists and we're not gonna be working with it. And third, trying to create new, I mean, as part of our curricula and, and discussing this with the students, I think we need to create new citizens. And, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very complex issue. I mean, that, that is in all our society, not only Latin America, I mean, in, in all the world, but we cannot ignore it and close our eyes or go together with it. Thanks. Go ahead. I, I want to keep that. Could could add to that, um, and it's the issue of corruption. Um, and and certainly, as the audience may know, this this has been a very worrying feature in in our in the South African democracy, a, a young democracy since 1994, um, fragile, uh, but but robust with a with an outstanding uh, constitution. But the issue of of government corruption has, has certainly come to the fore, and and this is. But it is an example of where the press has played, played an extremely important role in bringing this to the fore. And this is where I would also an example of an interaction between academia and, and uh, civil society. Because we have a school of journalism at Stellenbosch University, and some of our alumni uh, who uh, uh, have been doing some outstanding investigational work on, on this, on corruption, bringing this to the fore. And some of you may, may know that our ex-president, um, uh, President Jacob Zuma, has now been indicted again on, on 738 or 783 charges of corruption um, and, and, will, and, will, and will, face, uh, will, will have to face these charges. And it's very much as a result of some of the outstanding work that these journalists have also done. In addition to that, um, we've, uh, at the beginning of this year, we had a, a conference, an international conference that was very well attended, uh, got quite a bit of coverage on pseudoscience and quackery. Um, and I think that was, that was outstanding. And it speaks to, to, to your next point about um, education 
and, and scientific um, science journalism. Um, but my question to Nick is, if, if you may care, if I'm, uh, is, is you haven't addressed why, because we've also seen in the press in South Africa the decimation of newsrooms, the juniorization of newsrooms, is how, how would you expect scientific journalists to earn a living and be able to do that? Well, um, I, I think that's a very good question. I look uh, with um, an, uh, envy at the world of science where, you know, I always get into these conversations where I talk to my scientist friends, they say, oh, the devastating budget cuts we've been through, it's incredible. And then I tell them about the numbers I just told you about the loss in headcount in journalism and they just, people just aren't aware of it. Um, so I, I, I think the lesson from science as a structured field to us is, you know, we are, in, in much of the world, including the U.S., a proudly and determinedly uncredentialed field, unlicensed, uh, trusting in the market to support us so bountifully that not truly market-oriented activities like science journalism would kind of fall under the general support. I think we need to rethink a lot of those assumptions. Um, the science world is much more structured and has uh, government funding protected by peer review systems, which are not perfect, but they're not terrible. Um, and I've been urging my colleagues in journalism without a lot of success to, uh, so far at least, to sort of think about can we use other truth-seeking and not necessarily aligned with the market fields as a model for how to structure how we can do our work in the future, rather than just saying as, I mean, if we were at a journalism conference, somebody would get up and say, but it's gonna be fine because somebody's going to find the new business model for news. I've been going to those conferences for the last 10 or 15 years and, you know, that plane hasn't landed yet. Or, you know, Steve Jobs' widow just bought the Atlantic Monthly, where I used to work, so everything's gonna be fine. That is, it's the sort of, Velasquez and King Philip model. Um, and, and I think we just need to answer the question, pose, think about the question harder in the way you posed it, and, and come up with more structured solutions to it within journalism. Great, no, thank you very much. And uh, certainly, then, the uh, courage of both the media and the, and the judiciary in South Africa has been inspiring for all of us to see. I'm going to move into just a different area right now, and it came up, Vim, in your last panel. We have such a remarkable and inspiring production of knowledge, but a deep gap in the translation of that knowledge into being utilized and scaled up. So, Anne, I'd like to ask you, from your perspective as a dean of nursing in Yale, how do you think we could do a better job, how can academia do a better job of working with other sectors, the private sector, civil society, to be able to translate, that, to match the translation of knowledge with an even greater zeal, sorry, to match the production of knowledge with an even greater zeal in its translation. Yes, well, I think I, I would identify first most broadly as a member of the academic tribe, just writ large, we're a global tribe, right? And what we have to do, I think, particularly in this era, is stand up for science um, with all its foibles and but some structure. Um, this is the time where we have to stand firm, and you can argue about the rose-colored glasses that Steven Pinker might be wearing in his new book, Enlightenment Now, but there is, there is a base and a foundation upon which we all stand in universities, which, which really is about principles of open thought, um, and I think increasingly the notion that we must have that thought translate into uh, the fruits of progress for people and, and, for, and, and for societies. You look at any mission statement of a university, there are often those same words that thread through and certainly impact um, on future generations uh, is an important one. Standing up for science, standing up for fact-based uh, work, standing up for diversity of thought, these are all the things that we should be pursuing as, as academics. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to, to acknowledge that at this point. STEAM has been literally powering the engine of human progress, science, technology, engineering, the arts that reminds us of what it is to be a human, medicine writ large for you know, health. 
Uh, and so I, I, I do think we have to stand up for that, and CGH does as well. Universities have the opportunity, university leadership has the opportunity to have a forum. Um, for example, my own president just published something in Scientific American about the value of universities in science. Ron Danis at Hopkins had done that about the value of early career uh, support for, for junior, uh, junior faculty um, to contribute. Many of you from other countries may have had your university presidents or leaders also um, speak in the open um, space about this. But to your point about how do we actually ensure that we have dissemination and implementation of what we, what we um, produce in the academy, I think first we have to avoid that false dichotomy of basic versus applied science. As uh, Shrinath Reddy said yesterday, uh, Reddy said yesterday at the Gardner panel, we must do both. I think we have to be careful not to privilege molecular biology over mixed methods, for example, which I think we do um, often in, 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 in universities. But in, in point of fact, every methodology and every discipline has an important role to play in getting knowledge out there. Um, and I, I would also say that I believe that innovation truncated from application is a form of waste. It's a form of corruption in a sense. Waste is corruption. Uh, new knowledge and tools that don't ever connect with people's lives um, is essentially moot. Um, so we have to demonstrate the relevance of academia uh, in saving and, and improving lives. Translational science is, in fact, the theme of next year's CUGH meeting, so I'll just mention that. Um, but I do think we are going to have to be more innovative uh, about, about really ensuring that what we do in a fairly slow way often, the five-year RCT that results in a handful of papers that just a few people read, frankly, um, and then you're going to cycle up for another five-year cycle. We have got to move things forward, and implementation science is a nascent but developing um, space that I think is important for us to in engage in, um, and, and that's, that's an area that I, I think we, we, we need to get on in a more focused way. In universities. Thank, thank you, Anne. I'm going to go to Vim and then I'm going to go to Patty. By the way, uh, the presentations from the plenaries and others will be on CGH's website. And Patty, and her on the first plenary, really gave a spectacular presentation that had some dramatic slides about uh, um, inequities uh, in Latin America. So we will share everything, Patty. That was a powerful slide. Vim, uh, Cape Town and its institutions, Stellenbosch, UCT, and others. Um, you sit close by areas of deep need like Kailicha and others, um, but you've done something that I think all of us could take some lessons about. Many of our institutions sit near or uh, and close to uh, communities of deep need. So you've actually done a great job of scaling up things like community health workers in Kailicha. You've also been able to export the knowledge that you have to affect the health and well-being of uh, countries in the SADC region. So perhaps you could share with us um, some of your experiences and, and uh, knowledge about how academia can actually do a better job of affecting the social determinants of health uh, in communities in need. Yeah, and mentioned the, the, the nascent science of, of implementation science. And I, I would agree one has to be careful to um, denigrate or, or, or not uh, emphasize the basic science and, uh, and the ap applied sciences. Um, because it's the basic sciences that really underlie um, the, the applied sciences. But in, in terms of, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the, the research, that we, the work that we do is, is locally relevant. It's regionally impactful and globally competitive and regionally impactful meaning in, in our, in our, uh, on our continent. So in, in several of the uh, STEM areas, um, we've, we've tried to do that, and I believe we're successful in doing that. So in, in health, Keith mentioned uh, community health workers, and we've, we've certainly uh, upskilled uh, uh, health workers who, who actually have a, a very limited uh, secondary education to, to do the door-to-door the -door work in some of our HIV, AIDS, and especially the uh, also the, the, the tuberculosis, uh, delivery of tuberculosis care, where, um, where uh, uh, adherence to, to uh, compliance uh, is so very important. Um, in addition to that, we've tried to move away from the, the big silo, the, uh, the, the medical school, uh, to also have some rural campuses 
uh, on, on, on s in several areas, for example, uh, in Worcester, which is an uh, area distant uh, to Cape Town, where we, where we apply these similar, similar principles of uh, where, where the foundation is really as primary care, as family, as the family physician, as opposed to a more specialist-driven uh, system. So I believe there we've been, been certainly successful. So also in emergency medicine, um, uh, in, 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 um, in delivering care there. And that what we've done with regard to uh, uh, the training of, of Africa, and of physicians in Africa, is to establish a number, not only training uh, specialists, uh, and, and, but that they would, very importantly, that they would then return to their home countries. To, for example, we're training pediatricians from Malawi. Virtually all of the pediatricians in Malawi have been trained at, at Stellenbosch University. But establishing links where um, they, where you can have a south-south mentoring type link, and that that that's very important because if they go back and they don't have a a, a support network, you 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 find that they lost the system. And that's with regard to 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 health. With regard to agriculture, um, it's it's. In, so we, uh, our Faculty of Agricultural Sciences, probably have about 350 to 400 projects in 35 of the African countries. Um, uh, so these are transnational project, uh, projects with, uh, with uh, uh, looking at food security, crops, health, uh, uh, agricultural economics, the supply chain, wheat, grain, etc. So that's really doing stuff that's locally relevant but also is regionally impactful. Um, the, the other, um, science, water, food, uh, energy, energy sustainability, um, but lastly perhaps an area that, that's been particularly close to, to my heart is in uh, faculty of law, the issue of governance, social justice and, and human rights, and I think a, a very uh, uh, important appointment that, that, that we made there recently was the appointment of advocate uh, Tuli Madonsela, who is the previous public prosecutor, prosecutor in, in South Africa and, that, and who's really been a very courageous um, uh, fighter for uh, also against corruption in, in the South African system. And we appointed her as a, uh, a professor and a chair of social justice in our faculty of law. And she's really fulfilling this role of a public intellectual, this interface between the acad uh, academia and, and civil society. Thanks, Herman. I think that that interface between both is a, is a really critical point. More of us need to be able to produce that bridge, and, and Patty's done that. So, Patty, in your presentation on day one, you really showed us a very arresting photograph of uh, an, a community in deep need close to the airport. And can you share with us from your view, both being a former Minister of Health and a Dean of Public Health, what can academia do, to, again, to be able to uh, scale up the research that's produced to help communities in their region. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, um, it's one thing that we in the South, we are trying to do and we are doing because it's like working with our own communities. I guess one recommendation from the South to the North is don't think about doing global health only, looking down in the map or looking for Africa or Latin America, look around yourself. And um, I have been talking with several institutions for a long time when I was telling them how we implemented, for example, the rapid syphilis test. One drop of blood, 20 minutes, you can have the diagnosis at the office. The midwife can do it with the, with the women there. The women can see the result, can be happy if it is negative, and can see if it is positive, she can receive immediately penicillin, and we can solve the problem. We did that in Peru, and then we grow it in all the Latin American countries. But I'm surprised that here in the United States, you're having an epidemic of syphilis, and the FDA has not approved this rapid syphilis test. And now it comes syphilis and HIV, so you can do the two for one, okay? One stick and through drops of blood. So I have been talking with institutions telling me, oh, can you share your experience? Of course I can share my experience, but I think you have to think that there are lots of things that you can do around, and, and you have lots of needs 
maybe working with pharmacies, start thinking with Stanford, we are going, and I, I think, I hope with Michelle Barry, we're gonna be trying to, to understand this whole history of how to work with community agents in Peru, how, how to embrace them, uh, which ones are the ones that are more effective, and how, how this could be maybe translated into communities here. And I think that type of collaboration and, and looking around you as an institution and your communities around, I think I, that's a way of strengthening global and local health. But let me make a little comment because we were talking about journalism. You're complaining about not, I mean, we don't even have scientific journalists, okay, in most of our countries. We don't even have them. And, um, but, but it's true, it's not only here, in the rest, what, what I have heard from the people that work in newspapers and in the TV, is that they are becoming, they, they are having problems because of social media, they are becoming independent, and I mean, I have seen very honest and very uh, intelligent, honest, and, and really passionate about journalism that eventually had come to me and said like, you know, I can lose my job because I have the pressure of the industry. The most that I can do is ignore the topic, okay? I'm not gonna go against you, but I'm not gonna ignore the topic because now, so it's the issue of maintaining their job or doing the right thing. So we are in the world and that's reality. But I think that going again into academia, one thing that we have not been doing well is training our students on how to speak loud, clear, and close. So loud, because sometimes we have to raise our voices. And sometimes in academia we're a little scared because we want to be, I mean, we want to be in, in the scientific part, very rigorous, rigorous okay? But some, and I have seen that in my university, saying like, well, we may lose the support of the government if we say so. I think we have to speak up. I said clear because we're used to speak very difficult, very difficult. So we have to go down and make everybody understand and close because we have to speak to the community and close to the ones that can make a difference, who are sometimes the legislators, which I don't believe them, in most of them, and probably you have the same problem, right? But some of them may be your best advocates. And so I, I still think that that's one area. I don't think how many medical schools have a class on really, I mean, how to speak clear, how to speak with the media. I mean, you have to do it, because that's the only way we are going to be bringing the message that we need. Thanks, Patty. Uh, we're going to go to some questions right now, so if you please line up uh, at the mics. Uh, we'll get to you, I'll you know, bundle the questions. Please be brief in your questions, so everybody will have a chance to uh, ask uh, a, qu a question. Um, as everybody's coming up, I just want to ask uh, Nick one question. You know, the saying goes these days, um, if, it, if it bleeds, it leads, and if it thinks, it stinks, right? So how can we translate this very dense and rigorous knowledge that's produced and published in journals and create a hook that's going to capture the attention of the media? Well, um, you're right, and it's that, that policy is getting worse because in my uh, long ago, younger days, you couldn't tell how many people had read a specific, every article in a newspaper, and now you can tell in real time, and, and you know, it's, there's a, like a stock market ticker in newsrooms on every article and how much it's being read in real time, and you can change the headline and, and, and increase or decrease the readership and see in real time how that's affecting it. So, as you know, we, we're really, really tied to that kind of public opinion poll model. Um, Stating what will be obvious to everybody in the room, um, journalists like to think of themselves as storytellers and, and sort of 
the basic narrative imperatives uh, are very powerful in our field because we're communicating to the public. So we tend to focus on scientists and their discoveries, the scientist is hero, that kind of model. That can be very problematic for reasons all of you know, but, but if you want to, um, it, it's easier to get journalists to focus on people and, and say, just make sure you focus on the right people than to say, don't focus on people at all, just focus on the findings. Um, so if you, if you want not to fight the natural imperatives of journalism, I think you can, it's an easier battle to win to say, uh, here's how to find the actually significant discoveries in scientists, and here's how to, com to understand their import, rather than to say, stop with your focus on personalities and breakthroughs. That's simply not the way our field works. And that's just sort of practical-minded advice. Thank you very much, Nick. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll go to questions. I'm going to take two at a time, uh, or however many come up for once. So, Quinton, please. Uh, yeah, um, I thought that was an insightful comment about um, the rule of law in South Africa. Um, so I'm curious, what has actually sustained the rule of law in South Africa? Um, and, or is it still sustained despite all the corruption? Um, and as a flip side of that, whether someone could comment on the distrust of law and the distrust in government in the United States and the constant erosion of that trust in the law in the United States. Because I'm intrigued, South Africa has sort of sustained through the Constitution a, a certain level of uh, faith in the law and people have been able to challenge in the courts constantly um, erosions and, and, and uh, uh, overstepping of the law. So there is still a certain amount of trust in the rule of law. So I'm just curious what, what is happening in the United States and the dangers of that and how a relatively young democracy like South Africa, is it just the constitution, which is a robust and good constitution? On the other hand, the USA has a supposedly good constitution, except for the Second Amendment, maybe. Um, <laughs> But would you be prepared to comment on that? Because um, I, I, I'm very intrigued that you appointed that, made that appointment on social justice, and I think it's a, a really good appointment to have in the context of global health as well, for, in particular. Thank you, Quinton, very much. Uh, please. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you all for your discussion. It was very interesting. My name is Paul Galanowicz. I'm an adjunct professor at City College and an organizational sociologist. And one question I want to raise, or it's really an issue, I don't know if there's much we can do about it, but it's something I think we should acknowledge, and it refers to the question of corruption, and those that become successful at addressing it or coming close to addressing it have a high chance of ending up dead, right? So I think that's an issue, and I'm wondering if there's things that institutions can do to better protect the people who work on these issues for corruption um, to reduce the fact that they might be a victim of violence. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So distrust in government, and also I'm going to ask Patty the question of protecting uh, people who are trying to bring corruption to the fore. Um, and since that was a question about the United States and distrust in government, do you want to take that one first? Well, yeah, so I, I, I think um, that we obviously we are living in an era that in some ways is very exciting where we have democratization of data and information. Uh, and there is a power to that. Citizen activism um, can, can come from that. The uh, activated patient can come from that. But obviously the downside is manipulation and fake news. And I think we are, we are learning more uh, about um, how uh, distrust in government um, locally and, and um, uh, at, at larger scales can be manipulated by that. And so here again, the political scientists, um, the, the data analysts uh, uh, in university settings, I think will need, need to contribute to that and continue to show, you know, tr shine a light on, on uh, the actual machina machinations. The other piece of it, of course, is that distrust of, of, of um, government uh, is related to economic well-being, and we know that many sectors and populations are being left behind, A, because they're, they may not be accessing higher education, and, and the sort of entry point to a middle-class life in many countries, you know, increasingly involves more education. So again, I go back to my point about being left 
left out of uh, university or uh, educational um, offerings? And are we doing enough to encourage um, uh, people to, to engage with universities? Um, so I, I think uh, we have some role to play in that and also to think ahead to the disruptive uh, elements that are coming, uh, the un unworking situation that, that, that we think is coming, to what degree will AI and, and other technologies replace the students that we're training today for, for disciplines that may not, not be um, available or as, uh, as engaged in the future. And, and of course, when one's well, economic well-being is, is disrupted, it leads to political um, distrust and um, nationalism, populism. Thanks, Anne. I'm going to talk to uh, Patty about what's being to protect. And Nick, I'm going to just ask you for a minute after that, just to share with the folks here about the numbers you know, that the, that journalists are being murdered around the world for doing a job. If you could, please. Thank you, Patty. Well, you're giving me a tough one. Um, I mean, I agree completely. I mean, people who um, are working in corruption are at risk, um, and they should be protected. I have to tell you that as a minister, for example, we were supposed to have like 12 people together taking for my security. I didn't want any, so I said like, I mean, I refused to have them. I was having only a driver until I started to expose several issues. So I end up needing having some people around, it, around me because I had certain attacks to my house. So um, that's true, but, but you know what? I think there are, there's corruption at all the levels. And this is a very complex problem. And, and as somebody said, complex problems have to take by pieces and you have to analyze what's going on. I mean, we have corruption even in small situations, okay? So I think as academia, I, I'm, I don't know how we're gonna be able to, to uh, really address the big issues that are happening in the government. But there are issues that are happening even at the levels of the health centers or the health posts. And issues that simple, as simple as how to improve data collection and data systems. How to have better systems for accountability. And those are things that we're working on. I mean, that could really help. In, in the example that I was giving about the rapid syphilis test, you know that um, in several of the health centers, people were queuing in the doors and there were people that were selling the seats in the queue so women could go to the front much faster. When we make this, the whole system simpler so women could be having the test and could be seen very fast, okay? So that issue, that situation of selling seats and queues became not really important and that at least disappeared. So. I think we have to think about those solutions. Participation of the community, okay, as vigilance of this type of situations, or empowering the community as part of the continuum of health. So I think we have to work in all the different situations and think that if we really improve, simplify processes in the complexity of the bureaucracy and of the processes, we can have lots of spaces for corruption and uh, so we have to simplify that. And I think it, academia is good at that. So let's try to work on that specific so don't get frustrated. And eventually we will we'll be moving to higher levels and uh, let's hope for a, for a future with less corruption everywhere, right? Absolutely, thank, thank you, Patty. Nick, if you could um, uh, share with us uh, the things that people may or may not know uh, is the, uh, the murder of journalists trying to shed light on massive corruption, including uh, massive environmental degradation, illegal wildlife trafficking, connected to organized crime gangs, and they're getting murdered in, in staggering numbers. Could you just share with us, please? I, I, I don't want to tell you a number, because if this is a scientist, I'm going to not get it right from memory. There's an excellent organization here in New York called the Committee to Protect Journalists, and if you go on their website, they keep running count of journalists murdered, um, uh, journalists jailed, journalists censored. The trend is not good. Um, and, and on the killing of journalists, you have, at the one end, heads of state who feel no compunction about doing that. And then, especially for American journalists, the sort of rising trend is terrorist groups that kidnap journalists, like Daniel Pearl, um, 
and, and, and kill them basically to get publicity for themselves. Um, you know, to be broad, uh, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of us thought um, free press would become a global norm. And it really is not happening. Um, and I guess the, the, in terms of numbers and, and institutional importance, the number one place that there was hope about that there's much less now is China, which really has, you know, declined to uh, revere press freedom and freedom of speech as something to strive for in a society. And, and then other countries uh, such as Turkey and India that formerly seemed to have a robust free press have gone backward. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's not a good situation. Thanks for bringing the other aspects of journalists that are not murdered but are jailed and tortured. Thank you so much for that. Please. Hi, I'm Tara Casebold. I'm a doctoral student at UNC in public health and a social worker. So I wanted to thank Dr. Kurth for mentioning other fields and methods and what they can bring. Um, it's really important. But my question is, I think of myself as an advocate first and a researcher second. And I know a lot of people who got into public health because they're really passionate about specific issues. They want to change the world. They want to make a difference. So how do you balance being an objective scientist but still trying to bring the issues that you care about to the forefront and advocate for those issues, especially if you end up in a political position like Patty, and you want to make a difference to those issues that are important to you, but not create bias or create skewed information or blow things out of proportion. Thank you. Please. Good morning. My, my name is Catherine Phillips, uh, and I'm a master's candidate at Georgetown studying global health. Um, and kind of re very related to the question that was just posed, um, in the kind of in the spirit of service to those that we'd like to serve or work with, how um, what have you seen or how do you propose effectively communicating and inspiring them to engage? Um, and that a lot one of the themes that I've heard consistently this weekend relates to um, the elitism of just or um, related to academia and to, to global health and science, and that. It's easy for us to speak, or we're trying to learn to speak to one another and to collaborate, but how are we translating it to the people that we want to impact and engage and get on board? Thank you very much uh, for your question. I'll get the yeah. number three, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Noor Tasnam. I'm a undergraduate student at Duke University. And I had another question regarding accessibility to global health and um, public health education. Um, I come from a low-income family, and thankfully for the financial aid that I've gotten for my undergraduate education, I was able to pursue a newfound interest in global health. So my question to the panel is, how can we improve access um, to public or global health education in primary education and inspires today's youth in low-resource communities to pursue such fields? Thank you very much. Um, first question was, um, how can you be an objective scientist and an advocate? Um, Vim? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, that, that would be the best combination, is, is uh, to, to, to be an, an advocate based on, on solid science, um, on, on evidence. Yeah, that, yeah, it's the ordering of the two. Um, so I, I, I don't think is that there's an, any inherent um, uh, contradiction there. I would I would certainly ad advocate that, that 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 should be the way that it, that should be should be done. Um, it, it 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 reminds me of um, just coming back to to a story about, um, some of you may be aware, uh, it's a great book written by Natalie Natris on, on the AIDS conspiracy, Science Fights Back. And it's, it's in the early 2000s um, that um, uh, President Thabo Mbeki at that time actually um, was, was, a, was a, a denialist, uh, HIV denialist as the cause, uh, cause, of, cause of AIDS. And the reason why this conspiracy or this pseudoscience or this myth took place it was four reasons that she, that she described why such a, 
a, a, cons uh, a, a myth or pseudoscience could arise. Is one, there's a hero scientist, there's a, there's a lone voice in the desert that seemingly has all the wisdom and has the answer to this. Um, and for example, in that case, it was Duisburg. Um, secondly, there are um, the so-called the, 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 the culturepreneur. Somebody's making money from it. Either it's because of garlic or it's because of uh, some other v v vitamin concoction, and somebody's making money from it. Number three is what it calls the so-called the, the, the grateful followers. So, some of somebody who's actually survived, who sings the praises of also of, of this. Um, and, but you never hear about those, that they've, that those who died who actually stopped their antiretroviral drugs, for example. And then the fourth one is the praise singer. The praise singers are sometimes journalists, sometimes others who, who, who in, in the less um, uh, uh, renowned sort of media would also uh, support this. So in that sense, that is why an advocate is so important and that it should really be based on, on solid scientific evidence. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I'm going to ask Patty the question on translation, and then I'll ask Anne the question on improving access to education, quality education in low resource communities. Um, Patty, on the translation side, how can academia do a better job of translating the knowledge that's produced? So, one of the things is that um, we're producing a lot of information, okay? But sometimes we became too exquisite trying to get their response to that specific line that we would like to do some more research. Uh, I think that uh, at some point, and, and we are not doing a good job incredibly, although we have lots of journals, and I'm sure that you are attacked uh, with lots of journals that are offering you to publish your publication. I think we're not having a very good community of practice about different things that we are doing. And I'm saying this because I realize during the, the days in this uh, uh, Congress that there are several people that are also working on self-testing on HPV in different parts. And we have all kinds of experiences that different experiences that we could share and improve how can we translate in our own settings what we are doing? So I, I think we have to do more on translating, taking the chance, working with the communities, and also working with the local governments on how to do it. I think at some point we need to take the chance of seeing how things work in the real world. But for that, I have to make a pledge to, to the funders also. One of the issues that we sometimes, and King is, as King is my witness, uh, sometimes we have is with the funders that don't understand that it's better, sometimes it takes some more time for the real implementation than doing anything in a very controlled space. Uh, but, but that translation requires four things that I think are very important, okay? I don't know how many of you have read, for example, the experience of Peru fighting stunting, chronic malnutrition, and how effective, oh, one person at least. Go, go into the web and, and look for Growing Tall, is the report that the, the World Bank has brought regarding how Peru has worked against stunting. And this has been the work of several people. We started this, this thing when um, we were at the National Institute of Health, and there had been several things that happening. In order to do good translation, okay, you need to have what I call the three Cs and one B. So first of all, the activity has to be based on evidence, okay? There has to be coordination. There has to be commitment, and that means political and economical commitment. And there has to be continuity. And it takes some time to do the tra this translation and takes effort. And I mean, I understand because I, I live from my grants also that sometimes funders don't understand that, but we need to try to 
pass that idea that in the translation doesn't mean that we're going to do something short. We have to work with several actors. We have to see how to work on this continuity and the commitment. And eventually, we will see the results of this that was started as uh, working at the National Institute of Health, involving the World Bank, and then several institutions and several governments. It has been more than 16 years, I think, but we are seeing the results. So translation is not going to happen in a short time either. Thanks very much, Patty. Three Cs plus a, plus a B. Plus a B. Three Cs plus a B. Before I just go to Anne for a second, for everybody who's here, and we'll take after that, we'll take the last three questions and then have a few minutes for, for wrap up. At the end of today, we will hold with the Pulitzer Center our fourth annual communications workshop where we bring in uh, scientists who are also journalists to be able to teach us how to be able to be better communicators. So everybody is welcome to come. It's at the end of today. It's not to be missed. Uh, and uh, here, within 11 miles of, of here, there's a difference of lifespan of 11 years in Washington, D.C. Looking at education, you can go to the northwest versus the southeast, and it's shockingly different. Right, so inequality and the, the role uh, and power of education to help change some of that. Um, so first of all, students are this incredible asset, not just at the universities, but uh, at all levels of, of, of the educational system. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that. You're the next generation, to, so to our social work colleague, uh, run for office, consider that. You all have uh, a lot of challenges coming up in, the, in these next uh, several decades, and it's going to be your generation that has to address it. So um, I, a very important point made by our, by our colleague about uh, not just free primary care access, which many countries are trying to address, but then there's that fall off be, be, uh, in getting to free and accessible secondary uh, school and then, of course, higher, higher education access. So again, that involves advocacy. How will the government spend its money? Not just to the Abuja Declaration and percent of GDP for, for, for health, but also for education, because they are intertwined. Um, certainly, there's a gender aspect to this as well. So for example, in Kenya, where I work, um, big emphasis on, on getting more girls educated. Absolutely important, a moral imperative, and we know the economic and reproductive rate um, ripple effects of that. But there's a pushback now that boys feel left out. So I do think we have to think about all gender access. Um, we know that for the STEM um, uh, disciplines, that scientific identity starts in kindergarten, actually, and you need that pipeline all the way through. So uh, again, when we think about gender um, equity in, in education, we have to think about those things. And then and the last thing I'd say would just be that we um, we make sure that we're learning from our our, our brain scientists, uh, connecting with schools of education, connecting with ministries of education and finance and health, because all these issues are intertwined and they are advocacy um, issues. Thank you very much, Anne. So, so we're going to go through the last three. Steve, are you there or? No, okay, just resting. Okay, good. Um, so we'll just take your last three questions, please. Hi, uh, my name is Manvi Bala. Uh, I am an undergraduate student at the University of Guelph, and I'm also um, VP of the Guelph chapter of Oxfam. And Oxfam is um, an organization that is like an anti-poverty organization and has a gendered perspective with women's rights. So um, interestingly enough, uh, the whole club is pretty much STEM. So like all the students at the club are, are involved in STEM or are taking undergraduate degrees or masters or PhDs in STEM. And um, my question to you was, it's kind of a two-parter, but you've already answered about um, the part regarding engaging the youth in these kinds of things, especially with advocacy. Um, so we're having an event next year, and it's a large symposium on women's health because we're really interested in these global disparities, and hence why I was sent here to find out more. But um, my question is, um, a big aspect of this, especially in our generation, we use social media a lot. And a big part of it is this whole fake news thing. So to have to um, be able to give these um, critical, like, basically what I'm trying to say is, my question is, how can we engage the youth to think more critically about these issues? Because as people, like as students of STEM, we might know more about them. So when we have these social advocacy events, we have a perspective that is more um, educated through science. But when we're trying to target the general population, we're having difficulties because our main way to contact them and, and integrate this education system is through social media or media. And it's very effective. We get a lot of response. The event next year is going to be amazing and big. but. We, want it, we always get feedback about critical thinking. They don't believe us, or they have questions, and it's just, with your leadership experience, how can we engage critical thinking in this generation with these topics? Thank you very much. Please. Hi. Um, 
My name is uh, Jennifer Wurdenberg. I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> and um, my question for the panel is sort of about, so I feel like in medicine, they're both here and abroad when I practice, there's this divide between the clinicians who are practicing medicine and the business side of medicine and the market side of medicine. Um, and I feel like in our fight for equity and translation, we are going to have to somehow bridge that divide between what I see as a clinician and as an implementation scientist for improving health systems and thinking about innovating and taking the facility as a jumping off point to identify needs and then go into communities, right, to pilot community health programs in the US or things like that. And without understanding that business side, I lose my ability to be sustainable or effective in the long term rather than just doing small pilot studies. So my question for the panel is, what is CUGH doing to help us engage the business market side of medicine and the advocates who are there in order to make us sort of like more powerful together to create sustainable programs? Thank you. The business side of medicine, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and I have a question for the audience as well as a question for those on stage there. Um, so I'm aware that I embody many of the disparities that we're talking about today. I am a product of a lot of undeserved and unearned um, privilege and financial and social support. Um, certainly, I haven't earned or deserved these things any more than our brothers and sisters in low and middle income countries. And so my first question is, um, if you could be so brave as to raise your hand if you find yourself in the same position. Yeah, okay, great. So we've got company here. And my question for those on stage is then if each of you could give an example of how you have not held tightly to this um, power in unearned privilege that you may have and instead demonstrated um, given up or humbly managed that privilege yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask about the, there was the question on critical thinking training, uh, and you want to take uh, that, that question? Um, how to engage the, the uh, private sector for CUJH? I'll, I'll uh, take that one, and uh, I don't know who wants to talk about um, how you have... Um, humbly reduced your position of power to be able to engage or, uh, or work through any projects or endeavors that you're engaged in. Um, critical, critical thinking training, Anne. Um, how can academia do a better job of inculcating critical training in their uh, education modules? So the, the skill set of, of uh, critical thinking is, is fundamental to becoming a safe uh, uh, clinician. So this is something that is certainly um, embedded in much of what we do in health profession schools. But it, it, it is a, 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 a ideally a universal um, uh, outcome of what we hope we are producing in universities. And I think the criticism that we often get is that around the world is that universities are sort of hotbed of left-wing politics and groupthink. Um, and I, I do think we have to be careful about ensuring that we do have diversity uh, of all kinds, including diversity of thought and speech. Um, and, and those are principles for which uh, universities um, ha have been known and have, have stood up for over the years. So um, the, way, the, the, the best practices and evidence about how to inculcate, inculcate critical thinking are, are areas that people are looking at and working on, and that is a, a scientific um, area of endeavor. Um, I'll just speak real briefly to the business side of things. I do, as I said, I think we need to be engaged in our business and management schools more widely as well. And I have an example of a, of a colleague who was a graduate of the Yale School of Management, um, Chuck Slaughter, who points out that tax and philanthropic dollars uh, are big. And we, we think about that as, as, as uh, academics, uh, what, which, which grant can we get from a foundation or a donor? But they're, they're dwarfed by investment and industry uh, uh, dollars. So he came up with this living goods uh, social enterprise, um, did an RCT of it. Um, um, uh, in Uganda, it uses community health workers with, in, you know, supported by information technology, um, and was able to reduce childhood mortality in the service areas by 27% for less than two dollars per person served. But I want to point out that a lot of the tools that he was able to incorporate in that in that project and that approach were really developed in universities, uh, information communication technologies, uh, mo mobile health approaches. So again, I think we do we do need to marry. Um, how can we be uh, entrepreneurial because it can be a form of empowerment. Um, for example, for for uh, for nurses and midwives to set up their own, um, you know, uh, and pharmacists to set up uh, dispensaries um, uh, and be able to su 
support their own family as well as, as practice independently and improve the health of their, their local community. So we, we need to learn those, those skills and, and collaborate with our schools of management who know how to do it. So I'll, I'll just, just because it was to see a GH and Ann answer, one other thing, if there's anybody here from a business school, management school, please come and see me. We've been trying really hard to engage business schools. It's a missing area in global health. Uh, we've been un largely unsuccessful uh, in doing that, with the exception of Anne at the business school at Yale. But we really would like to engage more schools of, of public management and, and business. Um, last question was about, I think, the, um, how we can do a better, all of us giving examples of how we have not asserted our position of privilege in the execution of our duties. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take a look at that. Yeah, maybe briefly, and it made me reflect on, uh, and I th if I could frame it, in, it's the three T's. Um, it's the three T's. It's, 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 it's time, talent, and treasure. So in, in, in terms of time, I would say that um, uh, the, the time that, that, that I've uh, taken to mentor um, students uh, and, and uh, scholars on, on their career paths going forward and, and, and helping them uh, get clarity and in the way going forward. The second T, perhaps in times of talent, um, and uh, being a, a gastroenterologist is volunteer services in, in, in communities and in, in local communities. And certainly the, th the third T would be treasure um, in, in terms of donations to student bursaries um, for for uh, poor and, and less privileged uh, students. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, another uh, T that I can mention in the talent. Um, I've just this uh, past um, uh, Sunday in Cape Town, by another reason to come to Cape Town, there's a, there's a wonderful Cape Town cycle tour. It's, about, it's a 100-mile uh, cycle race that's uh, um, done by about 35 to 40,000. 40, it's the largest timed cycle race in the world, and it's great. And I did it um, for student bursaries with a number of alumni from our university. So I think these, just a way to think about, about that, perhaps. I think that's a very eloquent way of, of ending this session. To you who are here, thank you very much for, for being here. And please give a big round of applause to our great panel.